Well, hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Caitlin Sutton. I'm a curator here at the Allport Library and Museum. And in recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, we'd like to acknowledge the Moanina people, the traditional owners of the land upon which we gather. We acknowledge and pay respect to all Tasmanian Aboriginal communities, all who have survived invasion and dispossession and continue to maintain their identity and culture. Well, welcome here to the third and final talk in this series for the Lani Pillar exhibition. It's really great to have you here. Um, and our presenters, as you can see today, are joining us uh, via the screen. As a cultural institution, we respectfully acknowledge the lasting trauma experienced by Palawa, Tasmanian Aboriginal people that has resulted from the actions of Morton Allport, W.O. Crowther and other individuals in the name of scientific research. So I'd just like to briefly introduce our two speakers today. Uh, we have Zoe Rimmer. Zoe is a Pakana Tasmanian Aboriginal community member from a large, yeah, thank you Zoe, our extended family from Flinders Island and Cape Barren Island with ancestral connections to the northeast coast of literally to Tasmania. Zoe has grown up connected to community, country and culture and has learned the cultural skills of basket making and shelves singing from her elders. She's worked in the museum and cultural heritage management sector over the past 17 years and is currently the senior creator curator of the First Peoples Art and Culture at the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery. Zoe is a PhD candidate at the University of Tasmania investigating how Aboriginal political activism and repatriation has shaped museums practice both within Australia and internationally through a senior Indigenous research scholarship. Zoe is an al alumni of the National Gallery of Australia's Indigenous Arts Leadership Program and is a current member of the National Museum of Australia's Indigenous, Indigenous Research Group. She has previously had a role as the co-chair of the Advisory Committee for Indigenous Repatriation and as a member of the Tasmanian Aboriginal Heritage Council. Zoe is, a, is passionate about decolonising collecting institutions through utilising collections and archives to maintain, revive and elaborate cultural practices. In 2013-14, she was awarded a Churchill Fellowship to explore the different directions methodologies and outcomes in museum engagement with Indigenous peoples. Zoe was the lead curator of the award-winning national touring exhibition um, An Unbroken String, which associated publication and documentary film. And our second speaker today is Ruby Taylor who took on the role of Associate Professor of History at the College of Arts, Law and Education in 2021 after a three-year CALE Senior Research Fellowship. Ruby is an award-winning historian with many, more than 20 years experience researching and writing the histories of Southeast Australian Indigenous peoples and European settlement for academic and literary publications, web resources and museum spaces. Uh, until early 2018, Ruby held the inaugural Coral Thomas Fellow at the State Library of New South Wales. She also held numerous fellowships, including the University of Melbourne and King's College London. Ruby's most recent book, Into the Heart of Tasmania, was published by Melbourne University Press in 2017, won the 2018 Tasmanian Book Prize, the 2018 Queensland Premier's Award for History, the inaugural uh, Joan and Dick Family Green Award for Tasmanian History and was shortlisted for the Ernest Scott Prize for History. Ruby is currently working on The Women at the Edge of the World, Surviving Extinction, uh, forthcoming in 2024. So please join me in welcoming these two amazing women today for this conversation of a kind of victory. Thank you very much. Thank uh, well, over, over to you, Zoe, if they can hear you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Thanks, Caitlin, for the, um, the acknowledgement and also for the introduction. Uh, and I just wanted to add um, by saying Mina Tanapri Waranta Takamuna, Milaithina Muanina Nipaluna Lutruwida, Mina Tanapri Ningimpi Nongampi Naramapali. So I acknowledge um, the country of the Muanina people of Nipaluna Hobart in Tasmania, where I live and work and, and where I'm speaking from today. Um, and I acknowledge and pay respects to the ancestors, elders, uh, community past and present. And I'd like to extend that acknowledgement um, and respect to all First Nations people who might be joining the event today, 
it's really hard because we can't see anything but the roof so I don't know if people are in the audience or, or online but um, yeah just like to extend uh, any acknowledgement to First Peoples joining us and particularly acknowledge the courage and resistance of First Nation communities around the globe who are continuing uh, this fight for repatriation. Thank yes, um, thank you, Zoe. I would like to just explain. Um, Zoe and I come together today because, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Because we, we're working together. Zoe is um, doing a PhD, which I have the honour of supervising, and her research investigates and documents the Tasmanian Aboriginal community campaign for the repatriation of ancestral remains and cultural material from the 1970s until the present and the impact this campaign has had on both museum practice and the revival of community cultural identity, spirituality and practice. Today we're going to talk about a key victorious moment in the Tasmanian Aboriginal or Pakana community campaign for the repatriation of ancestral remains. That is the repatriation in 1985 of the collection formed by Sir William Crowther, the grandson of the William Crowther who rem removed William Lanny's head. Uh, Zoe, can you begin by giving us some background to this victorious moment? Tell us about some of the history of Pakana resistance and activism. When did it start? And what was your community fighting for? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it really was a, um, a resistance that, that came that began at the very beginning of British invasion and and continued and so um you know across Australia the rise of the land rights movement um from the 1960s was really closely linked to calls for restitution of um cultural heritage and increasing awareness of ancestral remains held in museums and um I guess in Tasmania our community our, the Aboriginal community also had to prove our existence um, so you know that there was the closure of the Aboriginal the, the Cape Barren Island Reserve in the 1950s um, and Australia's broad policy of assimilation and so the islander community as it was known then um, you know weren't considered uh, Aboriginal, but also weren't considered white. So for this, you know, fairly ostracised community, it was really about um, um, confronting those myths of extinction. Um, and 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 campaigning to reclaim control of identity and ownership of land and heritage. Um, and, and this this campaign included repatriation, which really was, um, you know, a pivotal motivation in the Tasmanian Aboriginal community's resurgence. Yeah, and I think that's so good for you to explain to us because, of course, repatriation of ancestral remains is, is a national and international concern for Indigenous communities, but for Tasmanian, Tasmanian Aboriginal people, the first step was to prove that they had that right, that they existed. Um, and before we, to do a little bit more background, before we look at the Crowther Collection victory, tell us about the first major and perhaps better known victory in the Pakana struggle for repatriation, and that's the return of Chukununi's remains from the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery in 1976, if that's correct. Yeah, so um, I assume that most people in the audience know fairly well familiar with Truganini's story um, and the fact that she ended up on display at the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery. And so there were calls for for Truganini to be removed from display from, you know, 1947. Um, well, sorry, for probably before that, but the museum did remove her in 1947 um, in response to appeals from Archdeacon Henry Atkinson, who was, um, you know, uh, trying to uphold his father's, the Reverend Henry Atkins' promise to Truganini, um, and also the growing public dist distaste following the horrors of World War II, I think, really um, influenced the decision by T. Mag to remove these human remains from public view and put Truganini in storage, but they didn't um, heed Atkinson's request for a proper burial mm. um, and they continued to, to reject that um, even when it was taken up by Bishop Cranswick in, in 1953. 
So the TMAG Board of Trustees and their allies, the Royal Society, um, you know, from this time were successfully um, seeking the support of the wider scientific community to defend their keeping of Truganini's remains in the collection. And the Royal Society argued that, um, quote, it was inadvisable that the skeleton should be lost to science. Um, and so the government agreed at that time with the museum and the Royal Society and decided um, that the museum should keep Truganini's remains. And they, they made a commitment to um, build or facilitate the building of a, an Aboriginal, a special Aboriginal remote, uh, room um, or, you know, memorial to house these um, ancestral remains um, so that they could be accessible for science. Um, but the Aboriginal community took up this fight in the early 1970s. Um, a, an Aboriginal law student, Henry Penrith, he was later known as the, the activist Burnham Burnham, um, requested her remains be handed over from, you know, in 1970. Um, but again, the trustees sought the support from the scientific community to, to, to keep her. Uh, and so he staged a public demonstration at the museum, um, outside of the museum, should I say. But in the, the four years following that request, um, I guess the most significant shift in the campaign for Truganini's reburial was the establishment of the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre. And there was a, slowly, a slow increase uh, in media attention and broader public awareness and, and sympathy for this um, for this campaign. So, um, 1974, uh, the National Aboriginal Congress requested that Truganin's skeleton be placed in its custody. And again, T the TMAG um, director wrote for support from the scientific community. He wrote to the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Studies, which is now IATSIS. Um, and uh, he, he wrote to them for support who, and only a few years earlier they had advised the museum that they should conserve Truganini's skeleton for scientific accessibility but now they recommended that she be disposed of this quote disposed immediately in accordance with her own wishes and those of her descendants so this was a massive shift um, from I, I keep wanting to say IATSIS but it's at the AIAS the pre-IATSIS pre um, and their prehistory advisory committee. So um, it, it massive shift from them, but they made it really clear that they saw this as a unique case and not endorsement of future Aboriginal um, repatriation of future Aboriginal remains. So following that, the, the Tasmania Museum Act 1950 was pretty quickly amended in February 1975, and Truganini's remains were placed in the vaults of the Reserve Bank in Hobart until her cremation on the 8th of May 1976. Um, she was given, she was cremated um, under state-controlled um, cremation at the crematorium in Cornelian Bay, and her ashes spread in the spread in the Diontecasto Channel with representatives of the Aboriginal community. And so it's broadly acknowledged that this campaign marked the origins of the repatriation campaign in Australia. Yeah, and and what a highly, um, um, what's, about, what's the word I'm looking for, um, an event that was marked by um, a huge amount of media attention, but also um, in, in the years previous, I mean, with those calls by the, the Anglican Church for her Christian reburial um, had been going on throughout the entire 20th century um, and the um, cremation uh, of her remains, as you say, by the community was filmed and opened that um, national film, The Last Tasmanian. Um, but, you know, it, um, as you say, it was... It was pioneering for a much wider national debate about repatriation. And I think it is good to pause and realise um, how pioneering that the Tasmanian Aboriginal community has been in shifting um, the understanding and the importance and also the policies around repatriation, as we'll continue to talk about. But now I think we're ready to focus on that major Pakana victory, the return in 1985 of the Crowther Collection. And, and what, what was the Crowther Collection and, and who, who formed it? I mentioned earlier it was the grandson of the 
the perhaps more infamous, but I think perhaps no less infamous, um, grandson who removed William Lanny's head. So when when did this Sir William Crowther form his collection and, and why? Yeah, so the what became known as the Crowther collection, uh, it was housed uh, in the TMAG stores um, from 1961, and then it was formally donated by Sir William to the museum collection in 1963. And during this time, he was a member of the Board of Trustees. Um, so Sir William had an intense interest in Aboriginal remains, which was fueled by his medical studies under um, anatomy lecturer, Professor Berry at the University of Melbourne. And as Reby has said, uh, he's the grandson of Dr. William Crowther, the man responsible for removing Lanny's skull, um, and the son of Edward Crowther, who owned land near Oyster Cove, close to the former Aboriginal station. Um, Sir William was aware of the location of the burial ground and no doubt cognizant of the status that he could um, garner from, from his professor, Professor Berry, who was encouraging all his students to collect Aboriginal crania, especially those from Tasmania. So Sir so, so William boasted in his own writing um, that he remembered hearing stories about the natives um, and seeing several crania in the back surgery at his own home when he was growing up. So the small graveyard at Oyster Cove um, had been marked on a map by George Augustus Robinson um, when he last visited the set settlement um, before leaving the colony in, in, 19, in, sorry, in 1851, a an action that um, Cassandra Pybus in, in her book about Truganini, um, you know, notes that Dr William Crowther probably requested that. Um, so after exhuming the remains of 12 Aboriginal people buried at Oyster Cove between 1847 and 1860 with his accomplice, Dr Robertson, Sir William continued to collect, study and describe ancestral remains excavated al along with stone tools during his expeditions. Um, mostly these were in the state's northwest and Eagle Hawk Neck. Um, and he amassed a large personal collection of artefacts and human remains, many skulls of which were... Um, acquired or you know traded to institutions and other private collectors. So in 1961 Sir William still held three skeletons and 34 skulls which were as I said housed at TMAG and at the time he was considered an expert on the on the Aborigines of Tasmania writing and presenting papers con comparing anatomy and technology um, all with this same bias and conclusion that Tasmanian Aborigines were primitive and were extinct. And of course they were not extinct and at the time in which he was writing with such pride about uh, his collecting um, and forming, which was the largest single collection of ancestral remains, the community were, uh, who had all, always been, um, you know, resistant and, and activist, were um, emerging in, in what, you know, became known as the struggle in the late 20th century. Uh, and we know um, which first in the repatriation campaign began with the return of Truganini. And so it is interesting it seems to me to be reminded that what we think of the, the removal of ancestral remains as being a, a 19th century uh, mistreatment of Tasmanian Aboriginal people, we can see that it continued well into the late 20th century and not under any shroud of secrecy, but uh, totally openly um, and was uh, promoted and supported by the wider Tasmanian uh, community and by its most esteemed institutions, which, you know, agreed to house and, and as you said earlier, to even um, display these remains um, in a new Aboriginal room, uh, in a, what I think uh, Sir William Crowther called a semi-mausoleum. Uh, so, um, you know, when um, when you began researching um, the return, the campaign to repatriate the crowd, the collection, Zoe, in the early 1980s, you've talked to community members who were involved in that in that um, momentous um, and victorious return. So, can you tell us about how these community members went about getting? 
their ancestors back to country uh, from TMAG that had been held in the Crowther collection. Um, now, who did they need to convince or win over? I mean, was it the museum, the, the state government? Uh, did they have to go to the courts and win, win the, the matter um, over with the law? Well, I think the, the simple answer to that, Ravi, is that they had to convince everybody. <laughs> the museum, the board of trustees, the scientific community, um, the government. Um, and I guess with the, the return of Truganini became, you know, came this renewed sense of Aboriginal community rights. Um, and Tasmanian Aboriginal issues were for the first time at the forefront of national politics. Um, so I think, you know, there was there was a building up of um, the general public, wider public support. Um, and the Aboriginal people in Tasmania were looking for a future, a, a, you know, community focused on a return uh, to country. And um, someone in the audience mentioned uh, in the in the chat here, Roy Nichols. And yeah, Roy Nichols um, was heavily involved in the return um, of, of Truganini and, and following that repatriation um, on behalf of the TAC, he presented the new, the Premier, uh, Bill Nielsen, with an Aboriginal agenda setting out um, the demand for uh, recognition of prior Aboriginal ownership of Tasmania and the return of land to Aboriginal people. Uh, but this was swiftly rejected by the government uh, and, and it incited a more activist approach by the Aboriginal community. So following um, Truganini's return, um, there were renewed calls for the government to honour the treaty that was made by George Augustus Robinson at the end of the Black War. Um, the community set up an Aboriginal parliament on the lawns of Tasmania's Parliament House and presented a petition demanding the return of land. And um, Michael Mansell approached Queen Elizabeth II on the steps of um, Rest Point Casino when she, she did her, her visit to Hobart in 1977. And he presented her with a petition for land returns and a gift of Aboriginal stone tools, um, which I think, you know, was probably quite controversial at the time, um, but, you know, an incredible um, and, well, I don't even, I don't even know how to explain it, but an amazing kind of opportunity to um, shine international light on, on the campaign and the plight of the Aboriginal community here in Tasmania. Um, and so also, you know, following Truganini's return, there was this realisation of the extent of Tasmanian Aboriginal ancestral remains held in museums. Um, and namely, that was the shocking detail of the Putalina ancestors or the, the Crowther collection, as it was known. And so this revelation that the museum actually held a lot more than just you know, just Truganini, there were lots of ancestral remains there and in museums elsewhere. So the community really ramped up um, the fight for repatriation and harnessed this kind of unprecedented support from the media um, and, you know, just continued to gain momentum. Um, so in 1981 was the first... Uh, um, official request for the return of the ancestors from, from Portalina, or the Crowther collection. Um, and at this point, the TMAG trustees offered to share the responsibility of the collection with the Aboriginal community, but refused to hand them over. Um, and again, they sought advice to, to, to vend um, this position both legally and, and from the scientific community. Um, in 1982, the Tasmanian Solicitor General's Department found that the, the actual exhumation of the remains from Oyster Cove had been illegal. But even so, TMAG trustees resisted negotiations um, and continued to seek this, um, you know, broader scientific and museum um, support for the retention of human remains. So uh, these negotiations between the community and the trustees were, weren't going anywhere. Um, and so the, the TAC filed legal complaints against the museum, both the director and the chairman. Uh, one was under the criminal code alleging that um, they had interfered and offered an indignity to human remains by keeping them as museum exhibits. Uh, and the second um, 
complaint under the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1975, and one being the failure to notify the National Parks and Wildlife Service of finding and removing a relic. And at that time, human remains, Aboriginal human remains were considered a relic under that act. Um, and secondly, that they'd continued possession of the remains without a permit under that act. Um, so I think this is all such like um, incredibly forward thinking activists and, you know, using every single angle um, that the community could take, um, even though these these um, allegations were dismissed on technicalities by Hobart Court, it generated a heap of media um, interest. Um, and of course, there were so many other things going on at the time as well uh, around um, you know, the campaign for recognition of land rights, um, the fallout with Tom Hayden and, and the film, uh, the, the Last Tasmanian. So Tom Hayden um, was given exclusive rights to film the scattering of uh, a, a Truganini's ashes. And then he, he produced this film, The Last Tasmanian. Um, and in an interview on ABC, he told Michael Mansell that he was um, hybrid as he had no conti um, continuity with traditional extinct Tasmanian Aborigines. So these were still um, the arguments and the myths going on at the time. Um, and the involvement, again, with this film, the involvement of Rhys Jones incited further resentment and mistrust of science and archaeology. Um, and, and Lyndall Ryan suggests that this um, led the TAC to realise that they must run their own campaigns in the future. And it really did fortify the community's aim of, of self-determination, which which mm -hmm. we can see in the, the campaign for the Crowther, um, uh, Crowther collection. Mm -hmm. uh, and also um, my, many people would be aware of the, the Franklin Dam um, situation as well going on in, in 1982 um, and the Tasmanian Aboriginal community were deeply involved in this battle to save Aboriginal heritage sites from from that dam. Um, so the rediscovery of Aboriginal caves, cave sites, um, it, it, it really drove the Aboriginal community to um, not only demand control of our heritage from government, but also from archaeologists um, and that scientific community that, that we're talking about that are, were against repatriation. So, um, yeah, with the, uh, so not wanting to simply just join the, the save that the Franklin campaign, the Aboriginal community really used this and created an opportunity for re reconnection and assertion, assertion of sovereignty. Um, and throughout this battle, the Tasmanian government again outwardly and publicly denied the Aboriginal community's existence, declaring that the cave sites located in the proposed Franklin Dam inundation area could not be of special significance because Tasmanian Aborigines were extinct. Convenient. <laughs> um, but the campaign for the Franklin also created an opportunity to challenge the Australian Archaeology Association and lobby for ownership of heritage, including unconditional return of ancestral remains. And um, Ros Langford, who was uh, a Yorta Yorta woman, but lived with lived in the Tasmanian Aboriginal community for a very long time, and and really um, was part of the the early formation of the, the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre, delivered a keynote address to the um, Australian Archaeology Association Conference in Hobart in 1982. And for anyone who hasn't read it, you know, read it. If you if you have read it, read it again, because what she says in, in that um, paper is incredible and it still stands today. So she articulated the um, detrimental impact of white orientated science on the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. Um, Langford reproached the complicity of archaeologists in the colonial project from Crowther's grave robbing at Oyster Cove to the general inaction and indifference to the community's request for repatriation. Um, at the core of Langford's and the Tasmanian Aboriginal community's argument was self-determination. She says, it is our past, our culture and heritage and forms part of our present life. 
As such, it is ours to control and it is ours to share on our terms. So Langford um, called on the, the Archaeology Association of Australia and all Tasmanians to support the Tasmanian Aboriginal claim for repatriation. And following this, radically, the association adopted the following motion at its general meeting in 1982. They state, the AAA strongly urges the Tasmanian government to hand over unconditionally to the Aboriginal people the collection of human remains known as the Crowther Collection to, to be disposed of as they see fit. The association is of the opinion that ethical considerations of the manner in which the collection was obtained far outweigh any potential scientific value. Mm. So the combination of publicity generated um, by the legal action that was taken by the TAC and the successful use of media really shone a, an international spotlight on the broadening campaign for the return of ancestors, um, which was a real feature of this campaign. And um, conceding to this pressure, the Tasmanian government met with the TAC uh, representatives in February 1983 and agreed to legislate for the return of the Crowther Collection, but rejected the, the community's wishes for a traditional cremation at Oyster Cove. So now the debate became about um, control of the process. Um, the state government were determined to retain control over the disposal of the Putalina remains, um, as they had done with Truganini. And the minister at the time responsible, um, Attorney General Max Bingham, defended his decision by claiming that traditional cremation was, quote, a propaganda exercise by political activists. Um, Kerry Randrama Heffer, an Aboriginal community member and president of the TAC at the time, saw the issue as being part of, quote, an ongoing campaign to deny the existence of Tasmanian Aboriginal people. The government's actions are aimed at preventing any Aboriginal cultural revival in Tasmania and continued the genocidal traditions of governments in Tasmania. So um, Minister Bingham had planned to cremate the remains uh, at the crematorium in um, Cornelian Bay and have the ashes, this was his idea, spread spread over the southwest from a plane occupied by the Attorney General, the Commissioner of Police and representatives from the Aboriginal community. Um, and of course, the Aboriginal community were furious. Um, but by this time, the Tasmanian Aboriginal community through the TAC had become increasingly politically astute. Um, and these suggestion, suggestions uh, were refused. Um, and, it, and the TAC asserted Aboriginal community rights to control the entire process of their ceremony. Um, it seems um, that the, the state government's resistance to Aboriginal community controlled repatriation uh, was bound by the continued denial of the Tasmanian Aboriginal community and their steadfast rejection of land rights. Um, and so by this time, the community had also set up the Tasmanian Aboriginal Land Council, um, which later was renamed, renamed the Tasmanian Aboriginal Land and Sea Council. Um, and that was set up specifically to, to negotiate on, on land returns and heritage management. But when federal legislation failed and the state government continued to refuse to negotiate um, on either land rights or the Crowther Collection, Tausk um, made the radical decision to reclaim the Aboriginal settlement um, site at Oyster Cove. So this reoccupation of the Oyster, of Oyster Cove by the Tasmanian Aboriginal community really brought both the issue of community controlled repatriation and land rights to a head. Um, the community also built a hut down at Oyster Cove um, in preparation for the return of ancestral remains. Um, and 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 claimed that um, the the Parks and Wildlife Service hadn't been looking after the site at all, and it was covered covered in weeds. Um, so I guess throughout all of this this um, political activism and 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 um, lots of debate going on through media as well, um, the federal minister Clyde Holding um, came down to to intervene and try and um, facilitate. Um, the negotiations. 
Um, so it, it really seemed that the Tasmanian government's chief concern was that uh, a repatriation controlled by a resurgent Tasmanian Aboriginal community conducted in a traditional way would be seen as a political gain and a high profile platform for further um, political demonstration. And uh, controlling the cremation as a wider Tasmanian issue uh, would enable the government to continue to control the historical narrative and the future of Aboriginal issues in the state. So even after um, a number of meetings with community and the involvement of, of Clive, Hol Clive Holding, the government wouldn't agree to this the, to Aboriginal controlled burial. Um, and they then pivoted their argument, this time suggesting that there was not unanimous agreement from the Aboriginal community on the issue. Um, as you can imagine, there was a lot of criticism of the government uh, in the media, from the federal government, from the public, and of course the Aboriginal community who continued to protest and um, and circulate petitions. Um, and you know, not long after this, uh, the government seemed to sort of back back down and backflip. But it's it's a little bit unclear exactly what influenced the change. Um, but if possibly the national uh, spotlight and broader public back backlash no doubt contributed to their decision. Um, even so, they still were resistant to the community uh, undertaking the repatriation process through a traditional cremation process. Um, and so they, they then instigated what they called the Aboriginal Survey Task Force to survey the community. Um, and so they they shifted their argument from from of being against repatriation from political based concerns and began questioning the dignity of traditional cremation com compared to the use of a crematorium. Um, so, uh, and and they had unfounded concerns as to whether there was unanimous agreement within the Aboriginal community. So although this um, process was criticised by the TAC representatives for attempted interference and undermining of Aboriginal processes and accusations of deliberate divisiveness, and you know we can still see this these kind of patterns happening today with with a number of issues, um, the Aboriginal Survey Task Force presented the report to the government in June 1984, and this closely followed an, an announcement by the minister. Uh, responsible for museums at the time, John Beswick, that they would hand over the remains to the Aboriginal community for cremation at Oyster Cove in line with the findings of the report. Um, well, so well. the decision was finally made after all of this politics. <laughs> and it, it seems that um, the success of these uh, of the decision was, you know, obviously down to a whole confluence of events that seem to be down to political whim, ultimately. Um, the prevarications before that had been technical and, you know, was there a, a strong enough uh, conviction among um, the, the resistors to, to, keep, to keep pushing against this? And what's so interesting and what you've unpacked for us, Zoe, is that, you know, the, the repatriation of, of a single collection is actually part of a complex uh, activism and events which sees the rise of the Greens movement, the fight for uh, the protection of wilderness and in, in fact a, a kind of complexity there where the Aboriginal community is actually resisting that to a certain extent to say it's not wilderness, it's actually cultural, uh, it's country, we have an ongoing relationship with that. The, the importance of archaeology in bringing to light the, the significance of those sites and yet at the same time the community needing to uh, sustain uh, activism against archaeology to say, well, yes, but that's not to say that these things should be locked away or controlled by science. And, and a continuing conversation throughout all of this that you've brought to light is the, the constant need to remind um, the wider community that of the rights to have control over ancestors, over land, over heritage, over the conversation, over the very processes um, that keep getting undermined because of this, you know, t you know, oppressive notion of extinction. And the idea of, um, you know, the success of the repatriation was momentous because it, it did reflect um, uh, 
a, a recognition, a, a shift. So, you know, once the crowd, the collection was returned to the Pakana community, um, what did they do with it? I mean, you've explained this desire to cremate. Uh, they've, they've built a hut. They don't want the cremated remains scattered over, um, throw it from an aeroplane, which seems just absurd and ridiculous. So what did they do do with them? And 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 why, again, was it so important to, to have those remains back on country? Um, oh, yeah, well... <laughs> You know, through all this, um, you, the Aboriginal community have maintained the, that the, the the argument that ancestors need to be back on country and they don't belong in museums. Um, so whilst the decision was made to return the crowd the collection, um, Aboriginal community members, uh, particularly people like Michael Mansell, seized that opportunity to push the debate a little bit further and 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 reiterated those aspirations that. Um, Tasmanian Aboriginal remains in TMAG, in QVMAG, um, should all be handed back to the community for traditional cremation. Um, and that the government should be supportive of this and should financially assist this. Um, and that that uh, the community also expected the protection of Oyster Cove uh, post the ceremony as a sacred site. Um, mm. And, you know, then this re realisation as well that there were human remains spread all over the world and the community wanted support um, to, to seek those back. Um, and, and the key was keeping this issue in the media and keeping that pressure on the government. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, it, it sort of turned out uh, making the decision to return the crowd, the collection or, um, um, from the museum that, the minister actually made the decision to return all ancestral remains. Um, and that really um, quite upset uh, some of the scientific community as well, particularly those that had uh, said, yes, they supported the return of the Crowther collection. They still felt that there were remains in museums that should be, that should stay there for scientific purposes. And they really saw this as, um, well, they knew that this would, uh, have a wide impact on other museums uh, within Australia and also overseas, and and, and collections that are in univers were in universities and private collections as well. I just wanted um, to in intervene for a sec, Zoe, yeah. if I might, just to clarify. While scientists had collected the remains for scientific purposes and then defended their retention in museums for those purposes. Had any research been done on these collections in Tasmania and overseas? Um, it's, well, very little really. Um, <laughs> and, and very little real science, if you can say that. It's um, the science, the, the research that was undertaken on, on remains, say at TMAG, was in the earlier days um, through, you know, the scientists that were, were looking at phrenology and, and out things that became outdated very quickly. Um, I know that with the campaign, the international campaign for repatriation, that in often cases it's been the, the TAC who have done the research uh, on what and where and uh, where remains have ended up and they've gone to the museums and told them what they have. They're not even aware of what's in their collections. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's... So you know, slightly, slightly uh, rocky ground to defend uh, the, the retention of those remains if you're not even aware that you had them until calls for repatriation brought those collections to and light. <laughs> many, many issues around provenance and, and, and museum record keeping as well. And, you know, how scientifically important can something be if you don't actually have any provenance um, uh, detail? But um, <laughs> these are all sorts of arguments that, that institutions continually um, put up and are slowly, I think, coming to the realisation that, that, that um, it's not really a valid argument. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for explaining that. I, I'll um, I'll let you get back to to where you where you were in in your presentation, if if you wish, um, because you were you know you were telling us about um, how the Crowther collection prompted the return of all ancestral remains, <laughs> uh, and that the scientists were were very um, uh, upset about that, um, and 
yes, I'll, I'll let you get back from there. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess from once the decision uh, was made to return all ancestral remains, and, and obviously the, the Crowther collection was, was the first to deal with, but um, the amendments had to be made to the, the Museums Act. Um, and then the community picked up the, the ancestors from the museum as they had wished um, and took them to, to Oyster Cove, to Putalina, and uh, held this big community gathering um, and ceremony. Um, and so this momentous Crowther repatriation really set the precedent for those that followed. And it was about self-determination and community control um, and this a real increasing resurgence of cultural protocol and, and practice. Um, so and yet, and yet even even at this this moment when when the ancestor returned to country there's still an attempt by the state government to control the process. Can you tell us that, that sure. as you put it to me earlier, crazy story yeah, of, so uh, that involves a concrete slab and a massive stone? Well, the community um, undertook this, the, the cremation ceremony um, and, you know, people say there were around 300 community members there for this ceremony, that there'd been work gone into the preparation of constructing a traditional pyre of, of, of sort of the ceremony and a little bit of language kind of starting to, so it really instigated this revival of that, those, the beginnings of the revival of those, those um, cultural practices of following the cremation um, which is crazily in a last <laughs> attempt to to recover some kind of power or control over the the um, the process um, and regain control, I guess, of, of Oyster Cove and um, and an attempt to really move the community on. I think from from that reoccupation, the premier uh, organised for a concrete slab to be poured um, to form the base of a memorial on top of the cremation site. Um, but when this failed, and, and uh, Uncle Jimmy uh, recalls, uh, because our, our mob seen him off, he said, um, Gray then arranged for a large boulder to be placed on top of the cremation with the intention of putting a memorial plaque on it. Um, and um, you mentioned before with my PhD project, what I'm doing is uh, talking to a lot of community members who've been involved in these campaigns and, and recording some, some oral histories. And Rodney Gibbons, who was involved, um, told me that uh, when the, this big truck arrived with the, the boulder, um, community members that were still there at the time put their cars around, parked their cars around the cremation pit and and, um, and circled the, the cremation pit to protect it, um, which he says was a, uh, he says, I thought it was a pretty gutsy effort when you think about it. A crane was picking up the rock off the back of a truck and was swinging it around to put it on top of the cremation when the struts sunk into the ground. It had been raining heavily and as you know down at Putalina there the ground is soft as anything and the truck tip nearly tipped over and so they had to drop the rock and that's where the rock is now probably about 10 feet maybe away from the actual cremation where the cremation was done and probably only two or three feet away from the cars and those people. So in a way you could say um, they did Div that disaster was averted by the fact that the ground was soft and the gods were looking after uh, after the community members that were down there. So, you know, these these things sound really crazy to us today that they would happen and, and um, part of the importance and the reason that I'm trying to record these these conversations with community members and their, exper their, their experiences. Um, but yeah, really the, the Aboriginal community um, ceremony for the Putalina ancestors and other returned remains that have been held at um, Oyster Cove, this, this particular one brought together around 300 people, uh, the largest gathering of Tasmanian Aborigines for, for generations. Mm -hmm. um, and and at, at, it was also at this place that it was resolved that the community would seek the return of all ancestral remains held in museums in Australia and overseas. Um, so, I mean, the, what what you've outlined is the importance of the, the Crowther Collection in particular, but also more broadly in the repatriation movement. 
in a resurgence, you said, of, of culture, of, of pride in identity, and, and the fight that, that seemingly never ended right down to that last moment of having to avert a um, what might even be seen as a, a metaphorical rock that was going to yet again crush um, the uh, Tasmanian Aboriginal efforts to, to reclaim um, control over their, their history, their culture, their ancestry. And I think what perhaps, I mean, I can see we, we're in our last few minutes here and I thought, you know, we've looked at the positive, you, you focused there at the end of what you were saying, Zoe, on the positive impact of bringing community together and, and bringing community attention uh, to, to reviving and resurging culture. But do you think that um, the repatriation campaign has led to other positive change, um, perhaps even beyond Tasmania? Mm -hmm. um, yes, well, it, it, it has um, in, in many different ways. Um, I think, you know, we were talking before about, um, you know, for the community, it's a real sense of responsibility um, to return ancestors to country, um, to right some of the wrongs of the past, to, to get acknowledgement for some of those wrongs as well. It's about restitution. It's about, um, you know, doing the right thing by those ancestors. Uh, and, and it is a healing process as well. Um, and, you know, I just I want to quote again Rodney Gibbons, who said of this this particular campaign, the return of the Crowther collection, um, you know, he saw sees it as the most important repatriation of human remains because it was a long fought community struggle over many years. And he recalled the return and cremation as a victory and that this gelled an organisation and a feeling within the community that things could be done. Um, and, you know, the, the community has gone on to show just how things can be done and how um, the, the, the persistence um, and the patience and the research that goes into these um, calls for repatriation, um, you know, they, it's, it's about continually going back and saying we're not going anywhere, we still expect those answers to come home. Um, and so I think, yeah, there's a real link between repatriation, um, recognition of identity uh, and, and land. Um, and this was a real clear difference between the, the, the Crowther return and, and the Truganini um, repatriation. Um, and yeah, that just the, the claim for ancestors to be repatriated is, is intertwined with the recognition of the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. Uh, and that the assertion of that ancestors need to be returned to country um, also meant that land was integral to Aboriginal spirituality. Um, yeah, that's a really important and beautifully put point, that, that, that integral and close connection between repatriation of ancestors and land. Um, and I think that, um, that I feel just, just from being outside the community, I think that gets forgotten. I think sometimes these things get separated. And I think partly because when we look at these issues, they do end up by necessity being mired in discussions, controversial discussions about law mm. and land and ancestors become two separate issues when you're reminding us here that they're not separate and they need to come together. Uh, ancestors go back to country and that you cannot separate those two. Um, look, I um, I just I just wanted to touch very briefly at the end, though, that, you know, you've explained to me earlier, Zoe, the impact that the Tasmanian Aboriginal community has made through these campaigns to changing policy in institutions, not just in Australia or Tasmania, but globally, that these discussions have been some of the most pioneering and forthright in the world. And I think that it's important that the Crowther Collection repatriation be seen in that international context, that this is not a local issue alone, is it? No, absolutely not. And so, you know, this is really instigated um, a change in policy pretty quickly within Australia and Australian institutions um, returning uh, ancestral remains, not just to Tasmania, but to, then to other Aboriginal communities across Australia. Um, and pretty quickly, the Tasmanian Aboriginal community took the campaign 
international. Um, Michael Mansell went uh, in 1985. Um, so, you know, at the, at the height of the, the, the battle for the crowd, the um, collection that was held at TMAG, um, it became revealed that, that perhaps William Lanny's skull was at the Edinburgh, um, uh, somewhere in Edinburgh, sorry, the oh, University of College of Surgeons, yeah, um, and so you know, bringing it back to what you know the the, the conversation today about um, Crowther and and the William Lanny story um, is that the the identification of his um, skull in Edinburgh then really took that campaign overseas, um, and I don't think though the museums or the universities or the institutions over there were were um, quite ex uh, expecting, didn't know what, what to expect, I guess. <laughs> no, I mean, it was audacious. I mean, yeah. this was a community funded uh, trip, was it not? Where people, members of the community, like Michael Mansell, among others, went, <laughs> literally just arrived at museums, is that correct? And said, yeah, it was you want our ancestors back? <laughs> seen as pretty radical at the time but um you know i think it put those institutions on notice and it was a long you know a long debate before the first uh, actual repatriation but um and then of course uh as you alluded to reviews the museums all over the world keep coming back to these sort of same sets of arguments which is around the inalienability of, of collections um that that uh, legislation um doesn't allow for for deaccessions and returns of of material um the importance to science uh, that, that these museums are holding collections on behalf of all humanity, that they're important to all humanity, um, and that returning one thing opens the Pandora's box, uh, and that they have a responsibility to, to educate the Northern Hemisphere about um, other, other cultures. Um, and now you, I'm kind of seeing this argument come around for, for cultural objects as well and, and this then placing of value um, on those objects, both monetary um, or uniqueness, but also around putting um, their, so their, their um, valuing the object as part of their own history. You know, it was their scientists that collected it or their maritime people that collected it. So it becomes subsumed in this kind of, um, yeah. yeah, it's part of their <laughs> own cultural nice. history, their, their cultural history of imperialism and colonialism and exploration. And um, yet at the same time, also arguing that these issues live in the past and, and therefore are no longer irrelevant, um, which again goes to the heart of undermining the, uh, the rights of the contemporary Indigenous community to, to retain um, or to repatriate uh, cultural and, and ancestral artefacts. Um, I see that we're one minute to two, so I'm not quite sure what, what if anything, I, I mean, I'm not sharing this so much as just holding the conversation. So, Caitlin, is there something, did you want us to, to uh, wind up or? Um, did, did anyone have any that you want to have? I can't quite hear you, Caitlin, so. Um, We've got a question in the back. Um, Okay, yeah, if you repeat it, then so we can probably yeah. hear it. Are there ancestral remains at Wybalena? Are there ancestral remains at Wybalena? Um, there were ancestral remains dug up and collected from, from there um, and sent elsewhere. Uh, there is a burial ground, but I, I don't, um, I don't know that, I don't know what's, what's, still there there was a big project a number of years ago about um trying to relocate some some of the burials um but yeah there is certainly rem remains from Wybalena in museums still in museums overseas so i'm not sure if that answers your question sorry anyone else well thank you both so much that was incredibly enlightening and um, we really appreciate your time so please join me in thanking um sorry Ruby. thank well, you you're very very welcome and and from me very well done zoe that that was a, a real journey uh, into your research thanks thank, um, thanks Ruby. thank you everyone um yeah your phd thank you thank bye. you bye. all right see bye. you bye